thank you madam thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone uh, i am indeed very happy that you have a very renowned person today for our the video conferencing uh, dr swaminathan he has a very rich experience in infectious diseases has worked in the cmc velour and um, also served in who and got a fellowship in vine university tv speaks much volume about him and i am very happy to uh, invite him for this video conferencing on behalf of every one of you on behalf of ima tamil nadu state this is the time that we have to work together fight together and make our country and the world safe um, from covid 19 so for that uh, ima tamil nadu is working very hard and doing lot of good work and today also as i was telling yesterday on your um, uh, zoom meeting uh, today we have uh, found out a person who can give an alert message with some of the members already raised the question how to handle the patients and we are uh, not working uh, uh, regular opd and everything and today i have talked to a person and he says there is a app that will uh, downloaded by the team of doctors and it will be circulated to the common man and he can contact the team of doctors by an alert message and he can talk to the patient or the common man or the anybody to guide them and help them what they should to do not only for this or any ailment so we will be launching that uh, probably tomorrow or day after and also as you know we have formed the ima uh, covid task force and we have formed the volunteers list and we have identified the stand alone covid hospitals and we are just uh, explained the government today that we are not going to have the 23% of beds in all the private hospitals and it might uh, jeopardize the interest and the problem will uh, you not have a total control on the disease itself which they are there in the public health they have agreed today and uh, this uh, by 2:30 we are going to have a uh, video conference meeting with the honorable uni health minister dr harshavardhan along with the national president and all the presidents of the entire uh, ima states and country and i am very happy that uh, the chennai export branch is, is very strong and powerful in many aspects as called a renowned person uh, to hear from whom what is going on another life so i do better words and i once again welcome you all and probably uh, in a day or two i will be convening the all the secretaries meet again to explain what is we are going to do and uh, regarding the ppes the first consignment what we uh, brought in and it is already um, distributed and the next consignment is ready it is going to come uh, we have ordered about 7500 n95 masks and the total coverall and the kits being uh, ordered and is being produced now and um, you can contact me or the state uh, secretary or uh, to get such a uh, be for your own safe because our own safety is paramount these days that is very important and unless we are safe we cannot go and uh, tackle these patients and uh, help the community at large and again we will come to the board also in order to get up 1.5 crores of mass and uh, 11 lakhs and odd total suit and everything uh with this uh, few words i think i'll sign off now and uh, carry on with your meeting since uh, i'll have to go and join with the another no, meeting no, no, no. thanks for calling me and asking me to join the meeting thank you so much thank you very much sir shall we can we start our meeting kanakavel sir please uh, mute everybody because there are lots of noises here yes ma'am <laughs> so i thank you and uh, i let our uh, Chief, just to talk about the uh, what is next. Uh, probably, can I go well, sir? Or I'll ask Dr. Santa Narayanan uh, to give the gist of the meeting and find kind of kindly forward to me so that it will be used yes, for us to what next we can do. Kindly, right. please uh, 
take important points and kindly forward to me please yes, sir. i am trying to record the entire meeting sir i will share with you it's already it's already getting sure, recorded that's fine that's more than enough that i'll i'll uh, mm. i'll look into it kindly share the link with me and look into it and uh, hear it later on okay sir thank you sir thank you sir okay thank you so much my name sir you thank you sir subramaniam sir ninga desktop share pannunga sir please i'm going to write now okay hang on kanakavel uh, sir kanakavel madam unmute pan mute panikenga madam please i i'll just introduce just request i will welcome kuduthu reporter subramaniam swami okay face it madam yeah it keeps dropping off one second i don't know why it keeps dropping off shanta ma'am ninga call panikonga ma'am ninga inform panikonga introduce panunga hello members uh, today we are going to have a covid 19 what next dr subramaniam swaminathan is going to give the lecture uh, he doesn't need any um, introduction from for our branch members i request dr subramaniam swaminathan to take over yeah um unfortunately i'm having a tough time trying to oh, give, please give me 2 minutes because i think i'm having no, some no, difficulty no, no, no. opening it it keeps dropping off yena theriyala ah sir, you know what please clear the background app sir abhi ah illa illa na email la open panni pa open panidra sir just give me that should be fine sir that should be Yeah, there we go. So everybody can see my yes, sir. My yes, email. sir. We are fine. We are fine, sir. <laughs> Just give me a sec. I think it is opening now. Yes. Right. Full so, screen, panne denga, sir, please. No, 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 no. Move. Ah, full screen. That work? Everybody perfect, okay with sir. that? Perfect. Perfect, sir. Perfect. Oh. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. so uh um, first thing is that um, actually our uh, society the clinical infection disease society of india has been putting up a lot of guidelines and protocols on our website so we have detailed guidelines on what is recommended for a stand alone outpatient so if you are having your own op what are the things you need to be aware of what are the things you should do how can you make your place covid safe and things like that we have documents on that we also have documents on treatment we have documents on workplace safety pp pp use all kinds of stuff so for those of you who are interested you can always go to sidsindia.org and you can find a lot of documents there which will be clinical relevant so this is going to be about covid 19 so uh, who has said uh, it's moved from an epidemic to a pandemic but i will still say it's still an epidemic of panic because uh, people are so petrified about what it is and there's still a lot of uh, uh, incorrect uh, uh, assumptions about it the data is clear but the incorrect assumptions of the data the predict the interpretation of the data has been a little wrong and because of that there's been widespread panic so we we'll talk about all these things the last major pandemic that we had was the 1918 flu epidemic flu pandemic remember h1n1 was also pandemic but the number of people killed was a far less than what they had anticipated the flu pandemic across america was a pretty bad uh, across the world for that matter was pretty brutal how do we know it's brutal because after the flu pandemic in 1921 every 10 years india does census and they look at life expectancy in 1921 for a boy baby to be born in india the life expectancy at birth was 19.6 years it was less than 20 years so basically that told you how many people young people especially were killed by the 1918 flu pandemic even across india 10% of the world's population was wiped out including in india of course none of us will even realize this because none of us were alive at that time and at that time nobody who was alive at that time was probably alive today or maybe there are few but corona virus is the one which we really worry about in terms of pandemic potential and it has proved true about 15 years ago we had sars about half a dozen years ago we had mers 
and now we have the 2019 novel coronavirus which is now called covid is it zoonosis is man made this is a unnecessary controversy uh, see there is no more brilliant test which will tell us what it is so far at least when we look at the, look at the sequencing of the virus it looks very much like the virus that's found naturally in bats remember a lot of coronavirus live naturally in bats and uh, let's not blame anybody for this when we start building uh, houses in the middle of their territory we are obviously going to capture zoonosis for example ebola that's because we went into the jungle scrub typhus we have scrub typhus all over india why did that happen we started uh, draining lakes and started building houses in that if you start doing that you will get scrub typhus same way this is also zoonosis which is crossed over to mankind so it looks very much like it is a zoonosis rather than a genetically engineered virus now how different is it from other viruses you know what i need my glasses so there are a couple of things we look at the two things we look at is the secondary attack rate what is secondary attack rate if one person develops an infection how many people get the infection from that person the second statistic we look at is mortality if a person develops an infection how likely are they to die now there will be no disease which has a high secondary attack rate what we call r0 and a high mortality because if that is so it will wipe out the human kind and second thing is if you have high mortality the patient becomes so quick so fast that they don't have a chance to infect many people for example ebola uh, and mers they become very very sick very very quickly and they die so much so that very few people got into touch with them and they got the virus in fact in mers the number one risk for developing mers was being a healthcare worker uh, ebola again same thing uh, sars and other uh, such coronavirus the mortality is actually quite low as compared to other viruses like ebola that's why they are uh, the risk of infecting other people is higher now how is uh, this for a novel coronavirus different from sars or mers now obviously both all of this came from uh, bats the animal to survive in sars was probably the civet cats a lot of civet cats were unnecessarily killed in uh, mars in mers it was the dromedary camels and uh, in the novel coronavirus it's wondered if it was a pangolin the cell receptor is the same as sars which is the ace2 receptor incubation period is about up to 14 days the majority happens within 5 to 7 days Uh, and the basic R zero again, we don't know. They are saying anywhere between two point four and three point three point two is what they are saying. A lot of people are using two point eight as the number based on which they are doing calculations. And the symptoms are usually fever, cough, and pneumonia. It rarely produces other system involvement. Worse because it works on the DPP four receptor. It causes a lot of GI side effects and kidney side effects. In this we don't have all of that. Asymptomatic transmission, although we say unknown, we suspect there could be some, and that's why lockdown is a good idea. nosocomial transmission obviously is very well known case fatality ratio i think we don't know because we don't we are not testing everybody uh, the only way we can say this is from the diamond princess the cruise ship where everybody was tested we know one person died and more than 100 people were infected so the true mortality is probably 1% or less so all the mortality numbers that you're seeing is not accurate because we are not testing everybody and we don't know the denominator we know the deaths but we do not know the number of people infected and of course the outbreak is yet to be contained now airborne infection only is a very dangerous phenomenon because you know you don't have to be very close to the patient you're going to get it directly this is a droplet infection so when a person coughs or sneezes they form heavy droplets which fall to the ground fairly quickly and when that happens these areas which are fomites become quickly contaminated so if a person touches these fomites and then touches their face in the eyes ears or nose sorry uh, eyes nose or mouth i'm sorry they can quickly get, uh, acquire the virus and then start uh, becoming infected themselves that is why we talk about uh, social distancing so that we stay 1 uh, meter away from any person second not touching anything as far as possible third washing hands as aggressively as possible and fourth do not touch your face you will notice that no one does it same mask because mask will not cut uh, because it is not airborne transmission so mask is not going to help a mask is not going to stop you from touching things a mask is not going to touch you or stop you from touching your face in fact the problem is when i see people wearing masks they are forever adjusting their mask i go airport la mask vechin paathana mask pole nan potu irukanga then they pull the mask down and then they have some drink then they pull the mask back up then somebody calls then they pull the mask down and then they are talking on the phone then they pull the mask back back up and when they they touch the mask they end up touching their face as well so in fact they are increasing the risk this way rather than protecting themselves so to me i think uh, for the lay public to use a mask is only endangering themselves rather than protecting themselves and this protection is slightly a figment of their imagination and besides we do need masks more for uh, 
the health care givers because obviously studies have shown that it's the most important thing along with hand hygiene in prevention of transmission. So this obviously is a little old. Uh, today's number, I can tell you, I'm just writing that as of March 31st, the numbers are 750,890 confirmed cases. Deaths would be 36,405. So uh, numbers are growing pretty fast. And it's everywhere. So we talk about uh, the stages of the pandemic. Government is talking about that, isn't it? So what are the stages? Remember, it's not from India. It has to come from abroad. So it has to come by travelers. So the first stage is phase one is when people who come from overseas develop the disease. That is why the government was saying home quarantine. But then not everybody is, uh, you know, some people are a little too smart or some people are a little too entitled. And they decide those rules are not for themselves. And when they do that, then we go into phase two. That is, there are people who acquire it from people who have done international travel. And from there, it's a short hop to community-based transmission. And that's where the risk is. Uh, you know, we are worried we're going to phase three. Phase four is where it's all over the place and we have a lot of people infected. And there, it is very, very difficult to stop it. So how do we keep it in stage two to stage three? First thing is quarantine. So basically, first thing is, if anybody comes in, Contact with the COVID positive patient, we need to keep them for 14 days in a closed area, irrespective of their symptoms. Second, contact tracing. Find out who all they've been in contact with and try and get them into quarantine as quickly as possible. Stop mass gatherings. Well, you know, they're always idiots. The point is, see, this is a good idea. Web-based teaching or web-based uh, experience sharing is a good idea because we avoid mass gathering. Awareness programs where you can have uh, public health messages going across to everybody else. Then prep work, getting, making sure that your facilities are ready, you have your combat ready and you have enough gear and equipment and whatnot and resources. So obviously you can see the percentages and you know where each country is. So what, ha what is going to happen in India? Uh, Johns Hopkins, it's actually Johns Hopkins. So they uh, created a model of what's likely to happen in India and they created three, three trajectories. One is high, the other is medium, and the last one is low. That is what is likely to happen if there is high transmission and uh, that is if the lockdowns are not working well and people are being an ass and they are walking all over the place like some people are. The second one is most likely scenario where there is some amount, a reasonably good amount of compliance, but the, the, the temperature and humidity doesn't help us. The low is the most optimistic scenario where somehow the virus becomes less deadly and the temperature starts helping us and the humidity starts helping us. Please don't get the idea that it's going to. Uh, the possibility that it will seems to be a little unlikely. So here it is. So what they are saying is, if we do nothing, uh, right now we should start seeing the numbers starting to go up. By the end of the week, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, everybody will start seeing numbers. By the end of the month, we'll have a huge, huge spurt. And by end of June, July, everything will die down. But here's the problem. At the peak of this, across India, we will need 25 lakh hospital beds. We don't even have 10% of that, which basically means we're going to have people dying on the streets. In the moderate scenario, it's about 18 lakh hospital beds at the highest peak, which will be sometime in uh, May, June. And in the lowest risk scenario, your peak is shifted out to June, July, and your peak requirement is 12 lakh hospital beds. The problem is we don't even have 12 lakh hospital beds. So you are going to have a lot of excess mortality. And also notice, if the peak is very high, we finish off the problem faster. If the peak is slower, the problem takes longer to develop and longer to resolve. But that, unfortunately, is the best case scenario. Which basically means, if it is good for the country, it's going to be absolutely miserable for all healthcare providers. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms are fever, a dry cough, a lot of fatigue, some amount of sore throat and shortness of breath in extreme cases. So initially, it starts off with a fever and a mild sore throat. Then the sore throat becomes so obvious. You have a hoarseness of voice. The temperature starts getting elevated. And they start feeling a little nauseous and some headache. Then they develop fatigue and body pain and muscle pain and a dry cough. This can progress on beds by the end of uh, the first week or the beginning of the second week. The patient can develop pneumonia as well. The majority of infections seem to be mild. At least four-fifths of these will be self-limited, mild infections where you don't have to do anything at all. Some of them are severe infections and about 5%, again, these numbers are very unpredictable because we are not testing everybody. So maybe less than 5% of patients are become very critical and they require intensive care treatment. So who is at risk? Number one, age. Age seems to be the most likely predictor. You know, we would think it's immunity. If immunity is the problem, then our babies would be a high risk. 
but as you notice in the graph no child under the age of 10 years has died because of coronavirus now that is an important statistic so we don't have to worry about children dying of coronavirus i heard a senator on uh, cnn saying so since babies don't get severe disease they should go to school that is the most moronic uh, statement i could expect from any uh, any guy you no know, yeah if you are uh, if you are elected representative i think uh, brains are of uh, low consequence the point why we close schools is because children are excellent multipliers and transmitters of the disease and we don't want that it is very difficult for children to produce to practice social distancing hand hygiene and cough etiquette and when they come back home and give it to the grandmothers and grandfathers it's going to be absolute massacre so for that reason we do not encourage school to remain open oh my god there are so many messages coming through so as you can see age is the highest risk factor for those 80 and above the mortality is close to 15% under 50 the risk is very low under 40 the risk for patients who are actually infected confirmed infected not we are not even testing already remember that the risk is 1 in 500 40 to 50 is 1 in 250 and above 80 is 18% 15% rather so other in the younger age group who gets bad disease it's those with heart disease those with lung disease liver disease kidney disease those with uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension so here's the warning if you have any medical comorbidity now is a good time to make sure that all your medical comorbidities are as well taken care of as possible because not treating them could have disastrous consequences so what are the general measures we are we are recommending to everybody especially the general public one hand hygiene is absolutely critical the more you do hand hygiene the better it is the second thing is respiratory hygiene so basically it means cough etiquette you do not cough into your elbow that's a common misconception that is wrong because the problem is the elbow elbow is not a flat area so if you try to cough into your elbow there's going to be spatter everywhere the place to cough into would be your arm you know midway between your shoulder and your elbow that's a flat surface so that you can cover your mouth completely in that area try covering your mouth completely in the elbow there will be always gaps and there will be spatter so coughing into the elbow is stupid coughing into your sh- shoulder or your arm is the right answer social distancing at least 1 meter apart people so if you're going out for shopping or if you're going out to buy your groceries whatever it is make sure everybody stays 1 meter away from you if anybody comes too close I'll shoot them away do not visit sick people i know it's a social etiquette to go say hi to sick people now would not be the time to worry about social nicety people who come back from international travel they should be quarantined for at least 2 uh, weeks uh, but then you know that's one problem which people are not been doing avoid non essential travel i think uh, that is no anyway not an option given the lockdown now so how can we prevent this like i said hand washing cover your nose and your mouth and avoid close contact with anybody the most important thing is hand hygiene so clean hands save lives there have been numerous videos on how to do hand hand washing correctly as uh, practicing uh, doctors it is important for us to know the steps of hand hygiene absolutely correctly so that we can demonstrate it and explain it to our patients my suggestion is make sure that if you are still having operation practice that these boards are easily visible to everybody and everybody is taught of these uh, techniques now social distancing what are the things you can and cannot do obviously social distancing doesn't mean that you sit at home and not talk to anybody and not do anything no that's not it at all there are certain activities which are absolutely bad ideas there are certain activities which are reasonable and certain activities you have to be very very cautious about so obviously having gatherings having play dates having a cme activity which is you know in person all those things are not so great uh yeah uh, theater going to the theater having visitors at home having workers uh, at your home things like that what is safe taking a walk inside the campus going for a doing some gardening playing with your children spending time reading books listening to music all these things are good to do and also be this is the time for you to make sure that you get to your your neighbors and your uh, the people close by so that the idea is that you help out each other in a time of need somebody is not well be a good neighbor and make sure that you are able to pick up groceries and help them out so that they don't the sick people don't have to go outside what about respiratory hygiene now cough your uh, Uh, no said mouth uh, i must say sneeze into your elbow i should say that's not acceptable you should sneeze into your arm uh, that's the right way if you are using tissues make sure you dispose of it appropriately wash with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or and i'll call this hand sanitizer so uh, at home you know you know soap and water is fine you can use just use a towel at home that's fine what about face mask 
not everybody needs a face mask. There has been a mass panic and mass buying of face masks. It doesn't make sense. The WHO is very clear. Who needs to wear a face mask? Only three types of people. If you have a respiratory illness, you should wear a face mask because you don't want to transmit that respiratory illness. Two, if you have a sick person at home with a respiratory illness, then the person who's caring for that person should wear a face mask. Third, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're at work, you should always be wearing a face mask. So these are the three settings where a face mask is useful. Outside of that, wearing a face mask is just a wanton expenditure and is going to hurt all of us at the back end. So uh, this is exactly what I said, when to use a mask and how to dispose of a mask. That's also important. Most people don't realize what a single use is. Single use means doesn't mean you keep moving it up and down and use it as a thyroid mask sometimes or a face mask sometimes and then keep it uh, keep moving it whenever you want to drink a drink or take a phone call and things like that. That's not single use. Single use means you put it on and do not touch the front portion of the mask. The mask will only be handled by the ties. And once you take it off, it's time to throw it away. You cannot be reusing the mask. This is a common mistake that a lot of people do. So, uh, cover the person mask. Uh, when you wear a mask, cover the uh, mouth and nose correctly and make sure there are no gaps. And do not touch the mask. If there is any reason why you have to do it, first do hand sanitization, then touch the mask. And as soon as, remember, these are single-use masks that they are not meant for you. And once the mask is not, uh, is damp or moist or torn or something like that, and if you want it for a significant period of time, take it and throw it into a closed bin. And, uh, and clean your hands with soap and water as soon as you discard a mask. What about testing? See, the government has given clear guidelines who should be tested. This is the latest guidelines. So, uh, the government is saying those who have come back from foreign travel, they should stay at home for 14 days. And in this period, if they develop symptoms, then they should be tested. If somebody is confirmed case, then all the family members should also be home quarantine. And if they develop symptoms, they should also be tested. Case and they develop uh, and, uh, and their contact develops symptoms, they should be tested. Healthcare workers who are symptomatic should be tested. Those who have severe respiratory illness where it could be COVID should be tested. And uh, of course, asymptomatic contacts, especially high risk contacts, should probably be tested. What are the testing methodology? There are only two types of tests. One is the serological test, which anyway are not available and they are not for acute uh, phase uh, testing. It's like a dengue IgG IgM. It's not going to be positive in the first five days, so that's not going to be helpful. PCR-based testing is what is most widely used. And nasopharyngeal swab is, or oropharyngeal swab is what is most commonly used. And uh, bronchoscopic uh, testing is obviously more accurate, but it puts the people who are doing the test at very high risk and therefore should not be done. We only do nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab, but that also has a problem in pickup. So please be careful. Just because it's negative, it does not exclude coronavirus. So this is for the serological testing. This is the graph. I'll be more than happy to set all the slides to you, so do not worry about it. Imaging seems to be a very useful test. The Chinese and even the Italians for that matter have been talking about how CT scans is actually quite good at picking up uh, coronavirus infection because they have typical changes on the CT scan. But this is a little dangerous because imagine putting a patient with uh, a lot of coronavirus into a CT scan machine and contaminating the whole area. So unless the facility is corona ready, they should not be doing CT scans to pick up the possibility of coronavirus. This could be dangerous. The other option is now more and more people are starting to do lung ultrasound at triage, where a lung ultrasound done in good hands in, the, in a person who doesn't have any major underlying lung disease, this kind of changes can be easily picked up. And it's supposed to be almost as good as a CT scan. No randomized trial, there's no outcome, but this is by, based on expert opinion. So this is what the government of India and the government of Tamil Nadu, especially the government of Tamil Nadu has said. If you suspect yeah, 3 lakh masks. Okay. Um, okay. So for those of you who saw it, something you know has 3 lakh masks. Important. Right. Um, so if you have a suspected COVID 19 patient, that is cute. Wait, I'll call you later. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, suspected patient with uh, COVID, you give them a 3 layer mask and ask them to maintain 3 meter distance. So crowd control in your OP room is absolutely important. I would strongly advise you to go through the document we put up in our uh, website. Then uh, look, evaluate the patient, see if the patient has mild symptoms. The government says admit an isolation area. I am a little uncomfortable with this because we start admitting everybody and anybody. There's no limit to the number of people who will have to admit. It doesn't make sense. Uh, we have decided that for healthy patients who have major, no major issues, then we are not going to admit, but we are admitting whole home isolation. If the patient is high risk, 
or the patient has risk factors, then we decide whether we are going to admit in the isolation area or in the critical care unit. If you are admitting them in the isolation area, remember, when you admit, you don't know if they have corona or not. They could have non-corona disease as well. The last thing you want is somebody admitted with an acute exacerbation of asthma and then acquiring a corona in the hospital. So those people who are admitted with the possibility of a corona have to be in a single room with an attached bathroom. Bathrooms cannot be shared. Bathrooms are a great way of ensuring that one coronavirus patient gives it to every corona, every patient in the ward, and then you have a ward full of uh, positive corona patients who you have unnecessarily made them positive. So please make sure that if you are admitting them, they have to be in a single room with an attached bathroom. No other kind of facility is acceptable. So if you are admitting them in the critical care unit, please make sure that the critical care unit is ready to handle for patients with coronavirus. So. If there is a mild case, they say admit an isolation area, two meter distance, that is nice. But then they have even said that the fact that you need a separate bathroom. It is very clearly mentioned in the WHO guideline. You can use Tamiya flu because you don't know if they are flu or not. If they are COVID negative, the patient is fine, send the patient home. If they are COVID positive, you continue treatment and monitor their uh, comorbidities. And how do you discharge them? The discharge criteria is once a patient becomes asymptomatic, you need to repeat the PCR. Either the PCR is negative, 24 hours later, you repeat another PCR. If that is also negative, then the patient is ready for discharge. So the government is insisting on two negative PCRs for the patient to go home. If the patient has severe disease and the COVID negative, then you manage them according to your regular treatment protocol. If they are COVID positive, then you make sure that you give them uh, all the required treatment. Here's the most important point. You cannot use nebulizers. Nebulizers are a great way of ensuring that you get infected with COVID along with all your other uh, um, all the other team members who are going to be involved in it. Because nebulization makes the virus airborne. So, no nebulizers. So, if you have nebulizers in your outpatient, I wish you luck. You should be using only meter dose inhalers. In our own hospital, in possible COVID, we are not using nebulizers. We are only using meter dose inhalers. So the government is recommending hydroxychloroquine as an option. In patients who cannot take hydroxychloroquine, they are using lopinavir, ritonavir. Do not combine these two. In fact, I would say do not combine azithromycin with uh, hydroxychloroquine. That's a great way of ensuring that your patient dies. Uh, for those of you who read the study, I will just go into it and tell you why it's a bad idea. And if the patient is stable, you can move them to a stable area. So remember, in mild to moderate patients, the general principles apply. Make sure that they are focused on hydration, Make sure that they give uh, get adequate uh, uh, paracetamol and things like that. In some patients, in the vulnerable patients, those who are high risk, like patients who already have pre-existing disease or something, you could try either local or hydroxychloroquine. Right now, the favor is more than hydroxychloroquine. If you are going to use hydroxychloroquine at 200 milligrams three times a day for 10 days, you should get get a baseline use ECG and make sure that the QTC is less than 500. You don't want the patient to unnecessarily die of cardiac arrhythmias, and we are getting more and more deaths of cardiac arrhythmias um, in, um, in these kind of patients. So do not use azithromycin, and if you're using hydroxychloroquine, please be aware that you could kill the